afternoon, everybody. This is Bonnie Vandermulen, Training Coordinator for Wisconsin Facets. On behalf of our entire Wisconsin Facets staff, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. Our webinar today is entitled Navigating the Juvenile Justice System, and our presenter for today is John Bauman. John is the Juvenile Court Administrator for Dane County and has been in the position for 14 years. John has 37 years of experience in the local juvenile justice system, including 21 years in nonprofit agencies. He oversees the county department, which includes a custody intake unit, juvenile detention, shelter home, home detention program, and works as a liaison with the juvenile division judges. John is active on many committees and was previously on his school board and was also a foster parent. It gives me great pleasure today to introduce to you John Bauman. John? Thank you, Bonnie. I appreciate, uh, appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to have a conversation with folks. Um, I do encourage uh, anyone to ask questions in the chat and Bonnie will, will relay those to me um, and please do so at, at, at any point. What I'm hoping to do today is just to talk a little bit about um, at least our uh, process in Dane County for um, making decisions about youth who uh, get in trouble with the law. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my department and um, our decision-making and uh, what parents can do to, uh, to help in those situations when their youth gets, gets into a little bit of trouble. So I won't read this um, directly, but um, you could see on the screen that um, you know there there are approximately two million children and youth who have significant depression and other kind of mental health issues, um, with 70% of them not receiving uh, much in the form of treatment, um, and we certainly see that in in in, in my department. Um, and the same for youth who are receiving special ed services. There is a very small percentage of, of students who um, have needs that aren't being aren't being met, and oftentimes that manifests itself in youth getting in trouble. And um, unfortunately, that involves the police at times. Um, and you know, 70% approximately of, of children and youth that are in the youth justice system are are youth that have a diagnosable mental illness, oftentimes um, not diagnosed though. And um, we all try to figure out how to best meet that youth's needs, even though there's not a formal diagnosis in place. Um, and trauma obviously is huge. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so my department <clears throat> has four programs in it. And um, I can speak to Dane County's processes um, which are uh, similar in, in a number of ways to all the counties in the state, but also is, uh, is different um, across different counties as well as um, certainly across states. So um, I, I primarily will speak to our intake process, and that is really where the decisions are made about what to do when a youth is, is uh, referred to us for getting in trouble with, with law. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the other programs as well, though. So the four programs in the department are the Juvenile Reception Center, JRC for short, um, Juvenile Detention, a non-secure shelter home, and then a home detention program. All of the programs um, in, in uh, my department work with youth between when they're arrested and when they have their final court order and is uh, primarily focused on initially decision-making as well as temporary placement and supervision of youth while court is pending. So once a youth um, uh, reaches the point of having a court order, we're typically not seeing those youth in any of our programs. So it's in that interim period of time um, while court is trying to figure out what to do with, with youth that um, my department's programs are involved. So the Juvenile Reception Center um, it serves a function of providing custody intake services for youth referred by law enforcement on a state charge. So each county per statute in Wisconsin has a 
uh, responsibility and authority to make custody decisions for youth if law enforcement feels that there is a need to refer them for such a decision. And <clears throat> that's what JRC does. And as you can see um, uh, illustrated in this, in this flow chart, law enforcement um, has discretion as to what to do. So if they um, arrest a youth, on a state charge, and in Wisconsin, it is 10 through 16 years old. Um, unfortunately, once uh, a youth turns 17, they're automatically in, in the adult system. And I, I certainly hope that that is changed um, at some point. Um, that that um, law was put in place in 1995, and 10 and 11 year olds were included in the youth justice system, and 17 year olds were excluded from the youth justice system and um, were placed in the adult, uh, in the adult uh, criminal system. So 10 through 16 year olds, if they um, encounter police and if law enforcement decides that they can't release that youth, they then refer them for a custody decision. And that is what our Juvenile Reception Center staff do. They, um, they are uh, reactionary in, in many ways. We don't uh, encourage or discourage referrals to us from law enforcement. Law enforcement has sole discretion, regardless of the seriousness of the charge. Um, they could refer and sometimes do youth on very minor charges, or um, they don't refer on things that are, are more serious. And it's totally up to law enforcement to, to make that call. If they decide to not refer a youth to us, or if my staff go through the intake process and decide to not take custody, that youth still has the charges that were brought um, to them, um, they, they still will go through um, the court process um, if, if that happens and there's not custody involved. That is um, a much different process than if a youth is brought to us and we take custody. So what happens is law enforcement um, brings that youth to us if they do refer and my staff go through an intake process where over the course of three to four hours uh, for each intake, they gather information. And initially that is from law enforcement to get the information about what happened and any other information they might have. They might have um, a lot of history with that youth or family. Um, and we wanna hear all of the good and not so good information that they may have. And that goes for every entity, every person that we, connect with during the intake process. So families will be will be called, typically it's by phone. Sometimes they may um, physically be at our, our uh, facility, but typically it's by phone. Um, the youth will be interviewed, um, collaterals, if there's a social worker involved or others who are important in that youth's life, we'll try to reach out to them and get information about how things have been going, um, good things that are happening in that youth that might help mitigate any, you know, any risk, um, potential options for placement or other kind of supervision, um, as well as, you know, the, the things that aren't going too well in, in, in a youth's life. And <clears throat> mental health status is a, is a huge factor in that. Um, so we end up trying to gather as much information in a much more holistic fashion, uh, as we can in order to make a decision. And that's very different than the, um, the adult system. The adult system um, really just deals with whatever the charge is. So if a youth, uh, if an adult um, is charged with something, it doesn't, it, it somewhat doesn't matter um, uh, about all the other uh, things that are going on in that youth's life, um, you know, positive or, 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 or negative um, kind of things. But it is very important in the in the in the juice in the juvenile system. You know, we really want to know what, um, if we can determine, you know, what was what was the intent in 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 in, in whatever happened. Um, is this typical for this youth? Um, 
is it a, a, a one-off kind of situation um, or is there a history? Um, and as I mentioned, we really also wanna know what else is happening in that youth's life? Are there um, mental health services that are in place that um, maybe have just started and um, haven't really had uh, much of a chance to, to try to um, help improve whatever the situation is? Um, as well as other services, you know, and that is something that um, is a big factor in our decision making. You know, we're we've got a pretty awesome responsibility to to gather information to make the best decision possible because that is impacting you know the the life and liberty of that youth temporarily and and can be quite disruptive. Our decisions are um, are. Uh, uh, ranging from a secure placement in detention all the way to releasing that youth back home or with um, a neighbor or a relative or somebody else without taking custody and and um, different st steps in between that um, could be our, our shelter home that could be um, taking non-secure custody of a youth which means that we're legally involved with that youth and um, we are representatives of the court and we're making a legal decision on where that use should be temporarily, physically, as well as what kind of conditions should be in place. <clears throat> if we take custody of a youth either and, and use secure custody in detention or non-secure custody back home or our shelter home or somewhere such as, 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 as that, there is a, a custody hearing that happens the next day. And a court commissioner is typically the person that that conducts that hearing, and they end up deciding on physically where that youth should be, and also um, what conditions should be in place, and they'll come up with a custody order that makes that decision. <clears throat> and that could be, there could be no contact orders, there could be certain prohibitions of, of, of going different places that could be including our home detention program as a monitoring program for that youth. Um, and it's uh, it's at that stage as well as the intake stage, and and um, as I said, each county has uh, the responsibility to to um, go through a similar intake decision making process. And it's at that point that it's really important for families, especially, to um, talk to the intake counselor, talk to the court commissioner, talk to um, anyone you can about what would be most helpful and what is in place, what kind of um, history uh, has been uh, has been has been occurring with similar behaviors and in, 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 in such. So John, I do have really a question for you. Yeah. Please. I'm sorry yeah, to please interrupt. Do. Yeah. Yeah. The mm -hmm. question that just came through that I think is relevant for what you're talking about is could a release be made to a mental health facility if there is a mental health crisis? Most definitely. Most definitely. And and that is for our intakes, you know, a, a, a huge consideration. You know, we we um, often will work with law enforcement, especially if there's uh, any potential need for an emergency detention. So if there's an ED need, we'll work with them and loop in Journey Mental Health in Dane County, which is the mental health provider that gatekeeps ED uh, placements. So, so that is, you know, and, and even um, for voluntary uh, hospitalizations, that's something that is really valuable information for us. Um, and, you know, we really work hard to not take custody of a youth and involve them in the youth justice system. It's a slippery slope, especially with youth who, who you know, have some some um, mental health issues. We don't want to criminalize behavior, and if there are resources such as, um, you know, any any kind of mental health treatment facility or even just services, um, you know, we we really really try to um, try to include that as an alternative to taking custody. That doesn't mean that the charges won't be dealt with at some point down the road. Um, and it also um, it, 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 it also depends on what the charges are. 
And unfortunately, if a youth commits something that is uh, so hurtful and, 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 and serious, um, regardless of mental health status, um, you know, we need to do what we need to do to make a decision to protect the community. And, you know, that is really, um, that is, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a big factor in, in our decision making, although um, most of the time, not, not the only factor that, you know, that uh, sways a decision one way or, or, or another, you know, we need to determine is there a need for immediate court intervention? Does the court, and we're representatives of the court, does the court need to be involved with this youth and, and family, but it's it's primarily the youth, sooner than later? And if it's sooner, that really leads to a custody decision that will involve the court and will involve custody and, and secure or non-secure. If it's determined that it's best to slow this process down then either you know if law enforcement wouldn't bring the youth to us or if we would have a referral of that youth and not take custody it's a much slower process so what happens in those uh, cases and that's the majority of cases in in, in all counties um, they're not involving uh, a custody decision and what happens is a police referral goes to the da's office as well as human services in whatever county um, the youth is is living in and human services per per statute <clears throat> has 40 days to do an intake assessment and that's a much more comprehensive assessment that they do and it's a strengths needs risk assessment interviews with the family with youth we really try to determine what what the needs may be and within that 40 days, they need to give a recommendation to the DA's office on whether or not the case should be a formal case in court, whether or not it should be a deferred prosecution agreement, or whether or not it should be nothing at all. A counsel and release is what it's called. The DA's office then has 20 days to agree or not, and they have the ultimate authority to to um, to agree or not to 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 that. So we're already looking at you know about two months out from when the incident occurred. So the immediate court intervention is the um, it, it, it is the issue that we always, when we're, my staff are making intake decisions, we need to keep in mind. And it, it it might be purely and solely due to the seriousness of the charge that the community needs to be protected. And um, that's the uh, reason for immediate court intervention. But on the opposite side, you know, especially for youth that have some level of, of mental health um, challenges, it often makes sense to slow the process down and to not jump in to that immediate court intervention. Um, because we don't, as I said, we don't want to have uh, that youth get deeper and deeper in the system um, if it's, you know, if it's not um, really a matter of community protection. Unfortunately, there are times that, um, that we see youth referred because there just is not there there haven't been services in place and that is um it's that's that's hard that's that's hard for us and and, and i understand the desire by law enforcement or sometimes parents to um to try to get something going for services and have a youth be arrested and referred to us for that but criminalizing the behavior of of of, of youth um especially with some level of mental health um, challenge is uh, it's that's that's tough that's a that's that's something that we really really need to need to consider when we're when we're doing an intake um, any other questions Bonnie that you can you can see right now I think that was it's a long a answer to that, that question. yeah I think it's a follow-up to that one and it's one that I'm not sure that anybody can answer, and that's, you know, how do we convince the general public that we have to attend to the to these juveniles' needs first as best as we can because they have mental health needs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's hard for me to speak to other counties because my whole experience has been in Dane County, and Dane County is um, is generally very cognizant of of the needs of, of youth 
that um, especially present, you know, uh, uh, with, with any level of, of mental health challenge. Um, and that's, you know, all the way from most law enforcement through, you know, through the, the our local judges. Um, and, and it's um, important to let anyone that a parent would have contact with, if a youth does get in trouble, let them, let them know, you know, that this isn't just behavior. There's a lot of drivers behind it. And especially, um, you know, having a conversation about what's been attempted and what services are in place or what services aren't in place, but might be needed. Um, so it's, that's, you know, that's, that's important. And we, we at intake, certainly all the way through um, different parts of the court process, you know, we rely on, um, on, on parents and in information they have. And that's not always something that initially at least is, um, is, it, it is out there. You know, if, if a youth gets in trouble, depending on what it is, um, what, what kind of behavior, you know, sometimes in and of itself, that behavior needs to be addressed. But as more evaluations and assessments are done informally or formally, you know, the, 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 the more of, the more about that youth's trauma history, their, you know, uh, mental health struggles, whatever it may be, um, that just better informs the whole system. So that that's pretty pretty important. Well, thank you. That's all so, we have right now. Okay, great, great, great. Um, so so this is uh, the same as every county in the state. We, you know, every county goes through this type of a process. Dane County and the larger counties in the state um, have standalone custody intake uh, programs. And that's that's what JRC does. Some of the smaller, most of the smaller counties um, typically have on-call staff, and it's typically human services, social work kind of staff that law enforcement contacts, and um, they then respond either in person or I think sometimes by phone and make the custody decision uh, that way. Dane, as I said, is a standalone uh, program and youth are brought to us at the city county building. So that's really our, our decision making. And, you know, we really work hard to, to not take custody of a youth if we can help it. You know, we um, would certainly rather not do, do, do that, but sometimes to protect the community and, and or sort out what the needs, the immediate needs are in order to to do that, and it is necessary to take custody, and, and sometimes you use our detention facility or our shelter home. Our shelter home is um, on the east side of Madison and is a placement for youth who placement for youth who uh, don't need the level of supervision and security that a locked, secure detention facility uh, would need, um, but need an alternate place for at least a period of time. Our detention facilities average length of stay for youth is a little over seven days. And it's a few days more than that for, for shelter. Our shelter is um, typically around 11 days for an average length of stay for, uh, for shelter. Kids at shelter are able to go out to uh, appointments, go to school, have home visits, all uh, and, and work and do a whole variety of things, all of it makes sense in, 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 um, in their individual situation. Detention, obviously, youth can't can't do that, and youth go between the placements depending on how they're doing and what the court uh, uh, allows to occur um, while court is still is still pending. Our shelter is also a, a, a really um, nice place for youth that are having some struggles at home. Um, and often in those domestic situations, and even if it's, you know, a fairly serious situation, um, you know, a battery to a parent and, 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 and such things, you know, shelter is, is often a good temporary alternative placement. You know, does that youth need to be in detention? Probably not. You know, if it's especially 
more isolated behavior. If they're beating up strangers on the street, that's a little different than if there's domestic situations at home. And it really allows for a little bit of time in order to um, to really figure out what what's needed and 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 what you know what kind of services should be in place. Um, detention um, is a placement that um, for for our detention and, and and there are twelve detention facilities in the state of Wisconsin in different counties, so not all counties have a detention, um, and that's the same for shelter. I think there are 13 shelter home licenses in the state, some of which are for younger kids, um, not all uh, uh, the same use that we uh, use our shelter for, so for youth in the youth justice system. Um, and our detention is a facility that right now we have 30 beds, we actually added built out a wing of detention when the pandemic hit, not knowing what we would need and um, were able to use some COVID funds to do so. But um, our uh, average um, daily population for detention um, prior to the pandemic, we were at 13 youth and that includes youth from other counties. And we have um, typically one youth from, an, from other counties on average across the, the year. So we were at 13 for, for a couple of years and that was um, lar in large part due to a lot of the car thefts and burglaries and, and that, um, that really spiked up some numbers. But prior to that, we were at um, a little bit over seven youth on an average daily basis. And that was in 2017. Um, and that had been a number that had been on the decline for more than 10 years. So as a system, even though Dane County's population of, of youth um, had continued to increase and still does, the numbers of youth that we were detaining temporarily in detention um, fell, which, um, you know, our system works very hard to, to try to prevent that disruption in a, in a, in a, in a youth's life. We um, are in a facility now in Madison that um, was built in and moved into in 2007. Prior to that, uh, we were on the third floor of the city county building and <clears throat> went from about 8,000 square feet to um, four times as, as, as much. So we're at around um, close to 28,000 square feet or so. And um, we, and this was my predecessor, um, he and um, many in the department and outside of the department did a lot of work on and a lot of research on facility design and trauma-informed care and um, the facility. And, and I'm, I get lots of tours. So if anyone on this call is, is, is interested at some point in, 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 in taking a tour through, I'd be happy to, happy to help with that. Um, pandemic has slowed things down a little bit, but I'm but I'm still giving some tours. I give lots of UW classes on tours and, 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 and other groups. Um, and the facility is one that has real long sight lines, a lot of glass, there's skylights that were able to be cut into the building when, um, when the, that whole, the whole second floor was essentially uh, demolished and, and rebuilt. Um, a lot of color, a lot of murals. We've had kids um, work with artists and paint murals throughout the facility. So it, for a lot, for a secure facility, is one that um, uh, uh, hopefully doesn't um, further traumatize youth. And of course, youth are locked. I mean, they can't get out. It, it, you know, um, but it's a full um, full day of programming um, during the school day. You know, youth have school all day. There's um, many, many different kind of enrichment groups and activities. We have dogs on call come in. And again, this is pre-pandemic and will be uh, post-pandemic, hopefully soon. Um, but we have dogs come in and, and do some, some, uh, just some minor, minor work uh, with youth um, and, and a lot of other kind of, of, of groups that come in. And, and we're fortunate in Dane County to have um, many different groups who are interested in, 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 in working with our youth. What we don't have is uh, therapeutic clinical services, and that really is a function of the short-term nature that youth are, are, are in our facility. What we really try to do if a youth has a provider or providers is everything we can to include 
them during the short or potentially a little longer time that a youth is with us, um, either at uh, detention or, or, or a shelter home. And we're certainly welcoming of any kind of, of um, ongoing services. And we, um, as many have, have really um, upped our game in just the whole technology uh, piece of, of, of um, working with youth. And um, that is something that the pandemic has really assisted uh, many, many, uh, many of us, not just in my department. And um, so we have lots of laptops. We have a, a, a lot more visits with parents um, virtually again, um, but also providers and, and others. So um, we, um, we will certainly be continuing that as well. And court, you know, and, and this isn't unique to Dane County necessarily, but, but many, um, many of the hearings are still virtual and youth are able to connect um, with, uh, uh, with the court through, you know, through laptops or iPads or other, other kind of technology that we have, as well as parents um, who can appear by phone. And so that has, I think, assisted um, uh, in, 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 in um, making a difficult process a little bit easier, where it's not as disruptive to especially parents who need to take off work and do all these things to um, be there for their for their for their youth. The um, shelter home um, average daily population is about eight youth on any given year. There's a, six, a 16 bed facility, um, and uh, and then lastly our uh, home detention program is a program that was developed in the 70s to be an alternative to um, a placement. So um, that is something typically that at that initial custody hearing, a uh, court commissioner could order home detention or a judge uh, at a subsequent hearing could order home detention to, to be there to um, help check up on the youth, to report back to the court, as well as support the youth and support the parents and the parents and um, do do whatever they can to help that youth be successful while court is still is still pending. So that's the uh, the fourth program. A part of my role as well, as Bonnie uh, uh, described in in her introduction, is to work with our juvenile division judges. In Dane County, there are four judges who are in the juvenile division. So I work with them on whatever kind of liaison work, whatever kind of, 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 of system improvement work um, that, that um, might, in, might help improve um, a youth's uh, involvement and, and um, uh, the, just the whole, the whole court process and, and, and service, uh, service delivery. So those are the, the four programs. A um, <clears throat> little bit of terminology, I won't go over all of this, um, but the juvenile system is, is, uh, is, is very different and really acknowledges um, the need to take a whole lot more into account than just what, what the charge is. The range of services for youth, ultimately, when they have a court order, um, could be services at home, therapeutic services while, while, while still remaining in, in a parent's home. <clears throat> it could be a foster home. It could be a group care situation, such as a group home or a residential treatment facility, none of which are in Dane County. There are no group homes or residential care facilities. So youth, unfortunately, need to go elsewhere to uh, county that has a facility. <clears throat> and then ultimately corrections is the um, most secure, obviously, uh, placement for youth who have just not been successful with other kind of interventions and placements up until um, up until that, that time. Dane County um, is still sending youth to Lincoln Hills and, and Copper Lake, which is the girls, uh, girls portion of, of juvenile corrections. We had um, had some discussions and planning to open a, a local uh, correctional facility um, as a part of um, my department, and for a variety of reasons that didn't materialize. Um, so youth are are in corrections um, up at Lincoln Hills Copper Lake. 
we, as of the beginning of December, and I don't have the January numbers yet, but we had, I believe, six youth that were physically there, and then others who were under a correctional order that were um, in the community being served through the Department of Corrections on community supervision. Um, and many of the youth that um, are under a corrections order, either physically uh, in, in corrections or in the community, are the youth that our community struggled with in the last few years with the car thefts, the burglaries, the um, pretty serious behavior that um, you know, potentially and, 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 and was um, quite hurtful to, to others. And for our detention facility, that is really the, the um, primary criteria that, that we use. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a couple of them, but the primary one is, you know, when we're, when we're refer to youth, you know, it, it, is there a substantial risk of physical harm to another person if that youth is not held in a, in a secure facility temporarily? So substantial risk of physical harm is a pretty high bar, but um, sometimes if um, a, a youth has committed a law violation where that is what happened, um, you know, that, 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 that bar has, 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 been, has been met. Um, <clears throat> the other for detention, at least, is if a youth misses court. So um, if they um, miss court, then um, the judge has discretion as to what happens to that youth temporarily once they're, once they're found. And sometimes that is automatically a secure custody placement. The, um, there, there is a set of charges that if a youth is arrested on one of, one of, uh, one of those, it's per policy, judicial policy, as well as department policy, it's an automatic, automatic secure custody placement. And that is a bunch of the sexual assaults, that's substantial battery, that's arson, um, uh, many of the more serious charges short of um, homicide or attempted homicide. Those are automatically adult, adult charges um, one way or another. But for those others, if a youth commits one of those and law enforcement refers uh, them on that charge, automatically detention is the decision that my staff need to make unless as the as the supervisor unless i grant an exception which often will happen for those younger youth um, especially who who have sexually offending behaviors so um, if there's a safety plan if there is some mitigation of risk of future victims um, then that is you know I, I'm, I'm happy to grant exceptions and, and, and quite often do you know, we don't need a 10 or 11 year old to be in detention if there's a safe alternative out there. And that's where it's really important for families to work with the intake staff. And uh, again, it's not just unique to my county, um, but it's really important for them to uh, troubleshoot, especially in those kind of situations. Um, but it even goes beyond the sexual assaults. So, um, you know, if there are um, alternative ways to keep um, others safe, while court is pending, you know, it might not be necessary to have that have that youth leave the home or um, certainly be in detention or, 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 or whatever. Um, but the majority of charges, and this is across all counties, um, the majority of charges that youth are referred on are ones where there's discretion. So initially law enforcement has discretion. They don't have to refer, but they can on anything. And my staff the same, you know, unless it's one of those real serious um, automatic charges, you know, my staff have a lot of discretion as to what to do. Um, we have a, 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 a value system that, um, in addition to training and statute and everything else, um, that value system guides who, who we um, use detention for, who we use our shelter home for. Um, and, you know, we work hard, as I said, to not detain youth if it's not necessary. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty big deal. And um, many of the kids that we see are youth that, that have trauma histories. You know, as the earlier slide um, indicated, uh, you know, we as a system um, need to know that, need to acknowledge that and do everything we can to not, to not further that um, trauma experience in, in youth. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but, um, but that's always front of mind 
for uh, for my my staff. Advocating for youth, as I said a number of times, you know, it is um, real important to ask questions, to share information. You know, there are times that, um, and I, I have a 30 year old and a 29 year old, and they're generally pretty good kids, but it's also frustrating to be a parent, right? And um, there are many times when my staff are, 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 are talking to parents and they've had it, they're frustrated and I get it, I get it. Um, and <clears throat> my staff um, often need to work with parents um, to try to figure out what the best temporary option is for that youth. And, you know, if we, um, if, if, a, if a parent and this happens, you know, um, tells my staff, um, keep them at it. Keep them. I, 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 I don't want them back unless there's a reason for my staff to to do so. Um, you know, we're not going to put a kid in detention just because of that. We might have to use our shelter home if there's truly no other alternative temporarily for that youth. Um, but. But I, you know, I, I get it. I get it. It's 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 a hard situation, especially if there's been struggles um, for quite a um, period of time with few supports or services for, for that youth. What we'll try to do too is um, be a resource and uh, provide information to parents. And, and Briarpatch is a, is, a, is a good example of an agency in town that really provides some informal services uh, for youth um, and, and families. Um, Children Come First program obviously is another one. Um, I worked for Dane County's CCF program as a care coordinator for three years, and then I was a manager there for seven years after that. That was before um, coming to the county in 2006. So we're oftentimes um, working with care coordinators um, if their youth are in, in, in involved in the system um, or referring parents. And I've, I've done it myself. And if I see an intake, my staff did. Um, and and it makes sense, you know, I'll, I'll call a parent and, and say, hey, you know, this is this is what wraparound care is. And here's a resource potentially for you that might, you know, might might help, might help. So, you know, we try to do that as much as we can as well. Um, and uh, anything we, you know, anything we could do to provide information and, and, and resources. Um, on our website, and you can see on the slide that I have up right now, there's um, a variety of resources, a parent's guide, which is um, just helpful information. You know, it's, it's, it's a whole nother world when a youth gets in trouble and you're having to deal with a whole lot of process that you've never had to and probably don't want to. Um, so there's some resources that I have up on our, on our, our website that at least helps explain what happens when a youth gets in trouble and ways that, you know, as a parent, um, ways that, that a parent can assist in, in, in that process. So that's some of the information that I, that I have, uh, have linked here. All right, Bonnie, any other questions that are coming in? Would you, there is a couple, would you suggest that individuals who are working in the field tour these facilities so that they understand better where um, the youth might be placed? Yeah, I think that's that's great. The more, you know, the, the more informed, um, the better for, you know, either the professionals that are working with youth or, you know, uh, other providers or resources that are in the in the community. I think it uh, it's it's helpful. So, yeah, certainly. I'm actually giving a tour next week when I'm back and, and I can't see anyone and I can't hear anyone. So hopefully I won't get a whole lot of booze, but I'm literally sitting outside in Florida and it's about high seventies now. Um, as I, I drove my mom down to, to winter down here this last weekend. So I'm outside and it's, it's lovely. Um, but I will be returning to the cold of, of Dane County next week. And 
I'm going to be giving a tour to a, a, a community group from the east side of Madison that I spoke to some of the representatives there. Um, and they're just interested in, in seeing what our local uh, detention and intake programs are like. So as I said, I give lots of tours to, to classes and, and especially social work classes and others. But, um, but if the timing works out, um, for me to do so with with others, I I, I could do that, and, and we certainly want to minimize and, and and be respectful of confidentiality. And so there's a certain time each day that that that's um, not a big issue. And in, in in between shift changes of, of of staff, youth are are in their rooms for a short amount of time. So we're able to do that and still maintain that that respect and confidentiality. So yeah, certainly. Um, okay, but, we have another question for you. Um, what would be your suggestion as the professional working in the field of things that schools can do to help not move forward the idea of school to prison pipeline? Yeah, that's a great question. Oh boy. You know, many of the youth and, and this whole pandemic worries me um, a lot, just with how disengaged some youth are. Um, Many of our youth just don't feel like they belong in school. They just, they're not engaged. They don't, they don't find any kind of uh, reason to regularly attend other than maybe some social reasons. But um, so I think the more that can be done to engage a youth and that may, might be, um, you know, just alternative methods of connecting with that youth and, 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 and it, getting them excited about being in school and staying in school and and knowing that um, someone cares for them you know i i've done a lot of focus groups of, of uh, our youth in detention with a whole, whole variety of, of of others um uh, involved with that and always the number one number one thing that you say when we ask you know what would what would have helped you or what will help you you know, be successful and 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 happy and such. And it's always adults in our lives. And many times um, the youth just didn't have an adult they connected with in it. You know, it's often a parent that someone can connect with, but but not always. And there's sometimes strained relationships, but but they always that always rises to the top. That having adults in their lives would have and will make a difference. And some are uh, saying that you know it's just someone to give me some some guidance and just and you know it's it, or a couple of dollars to go to a movie or you know. But to have an adult in their life um, it, it, and to hear these kids who are out stealing cars and doing some crazy stuff, um, it, it, for them to acknowledge that. You know, boy, you got to listen. Got to listen to that. So for schools, it's similar. You know, and it it ideally um, it, it it would be anyone. It could be a, a janitor at school or someone in the cafeteria or a teacher or someone. But you know, if I can make magic happen, I would automatically figure out a way that every student in school has one person that they feel they're connected to. So. So that uh, 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 two other items that um, are are always at sort of the, the top of the list as well for youth when they talk about what would help is activities they're interested in, you know, and these are 14, 15, 16 year olds. And they're saying that a lot of the um, opportunities they may have in the community aren't things that they're terribly interested in. It's more for younger youth or, but they just feel like, um, Again, not connected, not connected to the community. And the third is is oftentimes employment. You know, they're 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 wanting to have some kind of structure, some kind of way to make money, um, <clears throat> and to feel valued. So, you know, it's really it's really it, in in my opinion it boils down to that 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 connection, that connection to the community, that connection to school, that connection to an adult. Um, that that would be my my long answer. 
So there's another one, Bonnie? Yes, yeah, so we have one other one, and that's um, in your professional opinion, what other types of services and or facilities would you think if you had you know your your choice you'd like to see in dane county mm -hmm. yeah you know i there, there really isn't a facility right now that a youth could go to for a, a a respite period of time other than the respite center but if there's a need for a, a short break as an alternative to maybe a formal arrest and and, and referral um you know where there can be some kind of uh, services and i know dane county is is working hard on a triage center which might serve somewhat of the need for this but there really could be benefits to a program that has, you know, trained professionals as well as um, you know, access to connections and mentors and, 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 and folks that potentially could um, make that initial connection and then um, maintain that when when the youth doesn't need to physically be there for a, a short amount of time. The mentors is a huge one. You know, we we. Um, did a mentor pilot with some resources that United Way had, as well as some county money. And the pandemic um, created many, many problems with getting that off the ground because it was right then that, that 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 happened. But that really was a follow-up to what the youth were just clamoring for, which is adults and someone who's going to be there and be there even when they're pushed away. You know, so the more that um, we can help link those youth with those adults. Um, also, the better uh, and more successful uh, the community will be just in general. And I do have one last question, and that would be, what do you think are some of those most important qualities that some of your workers that work in all of the different areas in the juvenile justice program should display and should mm -hmm. have? It's an excellent question. So I, I tell folks um, when I give tours that, especially my staff in detention, you know, they need to need to do what they um, need to do to keep everyone safe and and, and 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 it's a secure environment. But if they, my staff want to be a jailer, they should go to the sheriff's department and work in the jail. My staff need to be social workers they need to have even though they're not certified I'm, i think i'm the only certified social worker in in in, in my department um, but they need to have that skill set they need to be able to connect with kids they need to like kids if you don't like kids i don't want you working for me you know it's uh, it's pretty crucial because kids know and they can see if you're if you're faking it um and that's across all the different programs you know you 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 really need to have an ability to connect with youth and folks have that at you know at various degrees of course but but in general you know the ability to connect and be genuine regardless of if it's a secure environment if it's a community-based program or whatever um you really need to have that skill set okay and john that's all we have as far as questions at this time so we're getting to the end of our time is there some closing statements that you might like to make <sighs> well i just i i appreciate the interest i appreciate the desire to Im improve the system and be involved and um, you know keep just keep keep advocating uh, because they're kids you know not I, I don't think there's a single kid in my 37 years that I I've worked with uh, worked with youth that you know start, started out as a baby wanting to get in trouble and be in the system or be in detention or wherever you know they're kids and um, Kids make mistakes, and hopefully there's enough adults in their lives that 
can help them through that and get to the other side without continuing to make mistakes, especially that are hurtful to, 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 to other people. Um, so, you know, uh, keep advocating and keep um, doing whatever can occur to help you feel like they're, 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 they're cared for, that they're loved, that they're um, a part of the community and um, anything to engage them and engage their, their, their interests to do so is, is um, pretty crucial in my opinion. Well, thank you, John, so very much. We greatly appreciate it. I know at this time that I certainly learned a lot and I'm sure that those on the call with us today did as well. So thank you for taking your time, especially from your retreat in Florida at this time <laughs> to, to share with us some of your information and I, I thank you. Um, this will conclude our webinar. We'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Please be reminded that Wisconsin Facets has over 100 scheduled trainings and webinars for 2020. And please check out our website calendar and register for any of the upcoming trainings that might be coming your way. Also, please watch for the short evaluation that will be coming to you after today's live presentation. So everybody have a great day. Be safe, stay warm. And again, thank you very much, John, for your presentation today. Bye-bye, everybody. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you, John. I'll send you an email. Sounds good. Thanks. Take care.